Okay, um, so now it is time for the um, Q&A. I think it's probably worth starting with um, the issue raised in that poll, which is um, how people sort of make it a practical business solution rather than a theoretical solution. So I don't know if you've got any sort of examples that you can give our audience on that. Yep. You have a go. Now, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. You, you throw me in. <laughs> okay. Throw me in. So, um, absolutely. I mean, I mean, certainly in the. It's it's maybe premature to say kind of in the early days of SOA because we haven't been trying it for too long. But certainly, if I look back three or four years um, at organisations we were speaking to who were really at the leading edge of this, many of them were very keen to leap into the technology without really taking a bigger view of, of what was required. And, you know, we came across a number of companies who would loudly and proudly proclaim, we built 3,000 services. Great. Does anyone care? Is anyone listening? Um, and, and the answer is probably not, actually. Um, it's far better to produce five services um, if those are of real value and they're going to be used in multiple places to gain consistency. And I think in terms of practicality and, and getting started, the frame for discussion has to be, like Simon said, it has to be what's the, excuse me, what's the strategic imperative that we have in IT? Uh, and what's the mix of pressures we have? Is it about rationalization? Is it about flexibility? Um, is it about a mixture of the two? What, what's driving us? And, and that, if, if um, as Simon says, what you can do is, is get permission to think more broadly, maybe not for a long time. I mean, we've come across organisations who've done very valuable kind of architecture exercises in just a few weeks. It's not months and months of, of people locking, locked away in a, in, a, in, a, in a dark room somewhere. If you can get the bigger picture of, of, of the context for IT work, then what you can do is start to say, well, in this business area, what we really need to do is rationalize our systems. And there you've got, then you've got a clear rationale for saying, right, there's a few key services we need to architect uh, and we need to deliver in quite short order to enable that rationalization to proceed. Otherwise, um, we're just going to be inventing stuff that nobody really needs. So in terms of practical steps, um, the challenge is, I think, that where I've seen this really succeed is it has to be a mixture of top-down and bottom-up. Yeah. There's no doubt that you can't just have a load of people noodling and saying, oh, I think we should build services over here and over here and over here. That has to be connected to the work that the, the guys on the ground are doing. Um, but equally, you can't have just the guys on the ground going and playing with the, the funky tools, many of which are free, um, and just you know, right-clicking on existing um, application uh, components and turning them into web services, because that does no one any favours. You have to try and work in teams so that you are bridging a top-down view, more of a strategy-led view, and a bottom-up view where people are actually down and dirty with the tools and with, with the problems they're facing day-to-day -day from a support perspective. Um, that's just one view. There's many other things to say, but is yeah. there, do you want to build well, on that a bit? I think you're right. It's all too easy just to increase the operational cost by 15% by making everything a service. Um, I, I think the question that I've asked more often um, that's moved things on when we've had workshops has been, what is it you can't do today for the business? And, and, and often the IT department have had to really think about this because, um, especially the, the, the older businesses, the business is so intimate with the applications, they tend to just ask IT to modify things, integrate new things. But IT then going away and saying, well, what is it we can't do for the business today? What windows of opportunity do we miss just completely because we can't react quick enough? By the time we've got the kit in, by the time we've changed that application, it's gone. We've just missed the opportunity. And that then tends to drive out the prime projects that really should be the first um, to be done in a service-oriented fashion to move towards this architecture. But that, that one question, what is it you can't do today? Because um, I often get IT departments that come in and they, they try and say everything's fantastic. I say, well, you don't, you don't need us then. Everything's great. They say, well, we can't do, we can't do this for the business. We, we can't change our processes quick enough. We can't get the customer information. 
It's got to be business driven. If it's not, then it, it is just an IT loving and uh, people get to put so on their CVs and not a lot, not a lot else happen. I mean, just to, just to quickly come back on, the, on that, um, coming back to the, the question you raised there, Abigail, you know, um, what's, uh, what's really making, what's likely to drive people, tip people over the edge into making the start right now? If, in the, as in the poll, they like the idea but they can't see how to apply it, you know, if I look at where organisations have seen most success, the kinds of scenarios that seem to play out really well are at the edge of the organisation, I think, typically. It's um, where the organisation needs to interact with customers or partners or suppliers. Because that's where there's a lot of pressure to change things more quickly, be more flexible. And particularly at the customer end, um, you've frequently got challenges around um, what people might call multi-channel service delivery. So let's say you're an insurance company, they work uh, through telephone sales, they have branches maybe, they have brokers, and they have internet. And one of the big challenges is how do we serve customers consistently across all of those channels? Um, that kind of scenario is, is, tends to be a very, very good fit for SOA types of projects because you've got the need for flexibility, uh, there's clear reuse mandate there because you've got you're trying to deliver the same kinds of capability in multiple ways to multiple audiences. Um, and, and there's a clear focus from the business. Typically, business guys in, in sales and services and marketing are saying, for goodness sake, we've got to get more efficient and effective at how we deal with our customers and be more consistent. So you've got that the perfect storm almost of a mandate from the business, need for flexibility, clear opportunity for reuse. Um, that's that's a, a, a real sweet spot, I think. Another example we had was with a um, utilities organisation, and, and essentially it was it was very um, price sensitive. So they were selling oil, and they couldn't really differentiate themselves on the price, but they could differentiate themselves on what they let their customers do. So they could trade their own oil and things like this. And essentially, what happened: the board met once a quarter and said, "We want to give this level of functionality to our to our customers." Now, IT then had to run away and make that happen, but it was all band-aids and sticking plasters. And what IT was very aware of, each month they're building the spaghetti up to a higher and higher level, where one quarter they would turn around and say, we just, we just can't do it. And they knew they had to get more intelligent about the way they were um, building and reusing functionality instead of just building it incrementally. So you'd say that perhaps starting with a small project is a good place, even though you are talking about a big change, maybe an example project, a demonstration of what you can do to really get people to see how it would work and then building from there? Yeah, yeah definitely. But it has to be something that um, has a business benefit. Too many people start with an IT project and it stays an IT project. Unless, as I said before, you're delivering business benefit and you're cleaning up the back-end infrastructure, it's really tough. And, and the other thing is, um, you can start with a small project, but you, you've really got to be conscious that unless you get it to an enterprise-wide endeavour, it, it will fizzle out after one or two projects. You won't get the buy-in, you won't get the governance you need to maintain the momentum behind the initiative. Okay, thank you very much. Now, taking the idea of um, SOA a little into a little bit more complex area, if you're, say, outsourcing some of your... Um, IT provision, how do you manage that between internal and external provision? It could potentially be quite complicated for companies. What, what would you advise there, Simon? If I start, again, it comes back to um, keeping the brains inside the organisation. You know, so having a clear strategy is absolutely key. If you have a good reference architecture, a good strategy, actually there's a lot you can outsource, but remain in control of, in control of your own destiny. Um, you know, uh, if you define services appropriately, you can outsource the construction of those services. But the key thing to maintain in-house is control of the overall strategy that you have. So I think there's a lot more possibility to outsource a lot more. Um, but, but, you know, don't outsource your brains. You know, work closely with a partner if you have to, but, but retain control over that. So if you've only got a small department, you want the really clever people who can really look after that um, strategy. I don't know what your experience has been like, Neil. Um, well, there's, there's two aspects to it, I suppose. It depends what's being outsourced. Um, so if you're talking about outsourcing development, then absolutely, I think, 
I, I would have nothing else to say. Um, where there's an additional wrinkle is if what's actually being outsourced is application management or even business processes. And there, the additional wrinkle is you've essentially, you're needing to integrate systems which span not only your own organization, but also the processes and applications you've, you've asked someone else to look after. Um, clearly, there's challenges there around you know, identity management, security, reliability, quality of service. Um, the good news is that actually, technically speaking, there aren't, there's nothing that's uh, really counted out. There's a lot of maturity out there in terms of the technology that's available, in terms of um, you know, um, managing quality of service over wide area networks with uh, you know, internet communications, XML, all that kind of stuff. There's plenty of technology available that can help you do that. It's, it's really, it comes back, I suppose, eventually to the point that Simon was making about just because you've given some, some operational execution pieces to someone else, doesn't mean you should outsource the architecture, outsource the strategy. You have to have a good overall picture of where you're going and why. Uh, and it's only then that you can really make sensible decisions about how you're going to put things in place to, to get the best, the best value out of a kind of globally distributed organization. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a couple of um, good questions here about both cost and um, um, uh, staff counts, um, head counts and redundancies. Um, what, what kind of concerns do people have? I suppose, well, it's two questions really. First about um, change is potentially a, a cost up front. Um, how do you justify that in economic times? And also change can potentially lead to um, loss of staff. So how do you reassure people about those two issues? Um, so yep. I'll, I'll say it's good. Um, they're, they're very, very good points. Um, but I really don't think they've got anything to do with SOA. Um, SOA is a, absolutely a change forcing thing, potentially. But the, the implications of that change are that if they're, if they're going to be negative, it's not because it's anything to do with SOA. It's because it's likely because there's some bigger problem that no one can do anything about, business is tanking, or it may be um, more of a problem of the image of the IT organization, the, the overall image of IT as a provider of value. It's just been eroded uh, and degraded and therefore the other parts of the business just think of IT as a cost center and will look for any reason to impose headcount cuts. And I think that's something that is above the level of SOA, that's about um, really how the IT organization is fronted and, and managed in the context of other parts of the business. Now, there is a connection though, which is that I've seen in a number of organizations, uh, a transformation using SOA has really elevated the status of the IT organization yes. and therefore put it in a better position if there is a difficult economic conversation to be had to say, well, look, we can clearly demonstrate we deliver these services and this is how they deliver value for these areas of the business. This is where these people work how they contribute to these services. You've got that common language again, the service-oriented language that, that business and IT guys can use to, to have mutually uh, interesting conversations. You can actually then start to attach costs and benefits in the context of that. Uh, and in some organizations, we've seen that to be very, very helpful in promoting the value that IT overall provides to the business. So SOA done right can improve the chances um, in difficult times, but... Yeah, no, I agree. I think, uh, you know, we're not doing this for the fun of it. We're doing it because the business needs to change and we need to change the way we, we provide the, the uh, functionality for the business. So, uh, you know, the we fear change doesn't, doesn't really wash. And I think we have seen surprisingly quickly what I would term reactive IT organizations become proactive. As Neil said earlier, you know, actually adding value to the business. So going from just a cost to a differentiator for the business. And what surprised me is, you know, done half right. That's months, not years. You know, people talk about a long return. I've seen three and six months IT departments change very quickly. Um, and I think the other thing about the cost is, you know, 
I said earlier, group the next five, six projects that you know you're going to do in the next nine to 12 months. Yes, the first project might cost you more because you've got to buy a BPM engine, but actually looking across the five, you've actually made cost savings. So I don't think again that we've got to look years and years. I've seen business cases in months. And, and what surprised me is if you are business led, I've seen returns in three, four, five months, especially when you're taking core broken processes and you're fixing them very quickly. Um, and the other element I've seen coming out of a lot of these business cases has been information to management that just wasn't available. And it's hard to put a, mm. put a price on that, but actually changing things to make this information available very quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, do you find there are particular projects or particular business sectors that where it's, it's best to begin, um, where, say, a particular business sector such as financial services, um, they, they benefit, from, benefit from it more because of compliance issues or are there other sectors that are benefiting or is it across the board and how do you know if it works for you? That's a really tough question because almost every customer we go into is, whilst they're whilst they're trying to achieve, achieve the same thing, do more with less and faster, they have different pain points. And I think um, at the first mistake we started to make was looking for the perfect first project, you know, the, the most burning issue. Um, and sometimes that most burning issue is too big. You know, we saw some, some um, energy providers take the home move process as their first process. Well, I don't know that much about utilities, but that must be the most complicated process in, in, the, uh, in the organization. Take meter replacement, you know, if that's an issue, that's a bite-sized thing that you can actually get a return quite quickly on. So let's not look for the, the most burning issue. Let's look for something that is an issue, what I call a hotspot, and something that can be achieved in a matter of months, not, not years. So it's got to be important, but we don't want it to bring the business down if it's two weeks late. Um, yeah, I, I echo that really. I don't think there's any industry where I'd say, crikey, you know, don't bother trying SOA there. I mean, you could argue about farming, maybe. Or, uh, um, but certainly I've seen, um, I've seen organisations have a lot of success in financial services, insurance, telco, retail, healthcare, manufacturing, utilities, uh, distribution. <laughs> A lot of it is tied into process effectiveness. Um, there's, um, and you know, the, the, what's interesting about process improvement is that it's, a, it's a, an evergreen issue because in good times, organizations want to improve their processes because they want to steal a march on the competition. They want to enter a new market more quickly. Uh, they want to buy other companies and integrate them quickly. In bad times, people want to improve processes because they want to cut costs. They want to become more efficient. Uh, they want to improve customer intimacy. Um, so I, I don't think there are very, very many places that are off limits. Uh, I, I said earlier, in terms of scenarios, uh, one that seems to work very, very well um, is uh, the kind of set of processes that sit around customer relationships. Uh, that's not CRM specifically as an application domain, but at the edge of the organization where you're you're interacting with customers uh, from sales or support or marketing, or those kinds of uh, those kinds of functions uh, seem to be particularly interesting because of the, the speed of change uh, and the, the the efficiency and effectiveness focus. Do you have some sort of simple examples perhaps you can give of specific sectors? Yeah, sure. Uh, certainly in retail, um, we've worked with customers who have had issues around some of their their overriding processes. So um, uh, purchasing processes where uh, goods were being brought through a central hub and it was just taking too long, but they brought it through the hub because they didn't trust the processes. Now once they've automated that process uh, and they've actually looked at it and um, compiled it from, a, from reusable sub-processes, it gave them the confidence to actually bypass the the distribution hub and ship direct to the countries, which is saving two, three weeks off of their, um, off of their um, procurement time. Now, they had a very rapid turnaround of goods, so that was a huge benefit to them. It's those types of things. So my advice would be, you know, look for the broken elements of the process. And the acid test is always, if I fix that, 
does that give me competitive advantage? It might be one or two steps away, but we have to be led by competitive advantage. I don't know if you can think of any other examples off the top of your head. Well, another great example, um, uh, telco. Um, and, and one of the, the very uh, sort of popular areas for consideration is um, provisioning. So more and more you've got telecoms companies, uh, mobile providers, for example, wanting to provision not only just simple voice service on a hand, handset, but provision voice, web access, um, some games, certain types of content, um, provision all of that in, in shorter and shorter time frames because that's a, that's a, a competitive aspect of, a, of a, a promise you make to a customer. It's a service promise. Buy this phone, it'll be live in an hour. You know, I remember when, not long ago, you bought a mobile and you couldn't do anything with it for a day. Um, that's one area. Another area with telco is um, billing and revenue, uh, revenue assurance. That fraud uh, is, uh, can be a real issue. And um, tightening up on, on rating and billing and, and, and looking at call records, again through integrating systems, service orientation seems to work pretty well there. You've got a lot of legacy systems. You can't throw them all away. You want a clean architectural approach to get rapid integration. Um, that's another good example in telco. It's a big question. We could be here all day. I think it's those real life examples though, where the yeah. example of retail that people can really relate to and I think that helps them decide which, which projects are going to mm. be yeah. best for them to identify. Okay, um, so going back to the, 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 the top level issue again, um, one question about this idea that um, SOA is jargon. Um, just how finally would you sort of convince people that it's not jargon? How do you take it away, take away the jargon and make it something meaningful and real to the business? To the business or to the skeptic? To, to the skeptic in the business. <laughs> right, well, um, I think the, the way to get around that is by not talking about SOA. Yeah. <laughs> um, so by, again, making it all business driven. So having a group of people who um, are able to take a company strategy, assuming there is one. If there isn't one, we're in a whole other world yeah. of pain. If there is one, to take that and then have meaningful conversations about, well, how can we deliver functionality to support these initiatives in a way such that we can, we can alter that functionality more quickly, uh, we can recompose it and recombine functions so that you can deliver products and services in a smarter way, uh, so that we can integrate systems more effectively. We've got a way of doing that. Um, you don't need to know the, the technical details. We've got a way of doing that. It's uh, proven in many, many examples. Um, yes, there are costs, but these are the benefits. You don't have to mention SOA, I don't think. I think you're right. You're never going to convert the business to the religion of SOA. But if you explain things at a, in that way, you'll get enough benefit of the doubt to go away and, and actually run some projects and try and deliver these benefits. And a key last takeaway is give yourself some KPIs, some measurements, because people are afraid to do it in case they fail. But I've seen many projects where the business has said, well, show us you've been successful. And unless they put these stakes in the ground, it's very hard to say, actually, you, you, ask, you ask for this level of service and we've, we've met it or exceeded it. So don't be afraid of measurement for, for these uh, benefits. Okay, lovely. That's great. Thank you very much for asking those questions. Really interesting issues there. And thanks for, for um, clarifying some of those points as well. Okay, that's all we've got time for um, for the Q&A. So I would like to thank Neil and Simon for their time this afternoon. And I'd also like to, um, to thank you for um, spending an hour with us. Um, I hope you found it useful. Um, sorry if we didn't get to answer your questions, but thank you for submitting them. Um, one last thing is um, just if you could take 30 seconds or so just to fill in the feedback survey, that would be really useful for us. That's one of the tabs along the top of your screen. Um, and really, it's just a question of saying that we've been talking today about IT for the integrated organisation and services-oriented architecture. Um, I'd like to thank our panellists um, for their contributions. You've heard from Simon Wright at Oracle and Neil Ward-Dutton at MWD Advisors. Um, thank you all for attending this web seminar. We hope you found it informative. Um, don't miss the computer, next computing web seminar on um, security in the modern business, which is on Thursday the 16th of February at 1500 hours GMT. Um, you can register at computing.co.uk forward slash events. Thank you very much and goodbye.